Hello there, welcome to Nepi Invest. I thought it was a good time to do a video on my investing strategy. So at the moment I've done uh, a plethora of videos uh, talking about individual companies, talking about this and that, but I haven't really delved into my strategies that I use on a daily basis. I try to stick to these strategies as close to as possible. Uh, I don't always stick to them, but I'm trying my hardest to stick as close as possible because I think it's very important to follow rules and stick to those rules when you're investing. So also talk about some of the inspirational people behind the my investing strategies. Uh, not only inspirational, but some of these uh, two partic particular people, um, they're not really the inspiration behind my strategies. I actually found them after uh, I've set out my strategies, but they I find them very inspirational um, when I listen to them speak and because they think very similar to me, but they have slightly different thoughts and I find when I can listen to them speak and sort of dissect what they think, I can find a lot of value out of that. So I'll talk about those inspirations and I'll just talk about some of the companies that I hold within these investing strategies and how I came to those decisions. So I have two investing strategies. These are my main two ones, and these strategies will sort of evolve over time. But during my investing life, it's come to these two strategies. Initially, I had one strategy, and that was the long-term growth strategy. So long-term growth is buying into companies which I expect within the next 10, 20 years will be of higher value. So in this uh, strategy, what I do is I look for companies that are growing and have the potential to grow uh, quite substantially over that time period. So I'll look at uh, Appendix 4Cs, look at um, financial reports, look at the history of these reports. So for example, here I've got Alexium uh, quarterly cash flow report. Then I've got these cash receipts. I don't know what company it is, but you can see the cash receipts going back to July 15 have been growing quite substantially through that period. So when I find that a company gets to an inflection point where they become cash flow positive, growing receipts, growing their cash flow, we see substantial uh, growth in value for that company. Not all companies get there. So in both my investing strategies, I don't expect 100% success. I think it would be naive to think you're going to be 100% successful. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of people believe you should be 100% successful. My second strategy is a strategy I have evolved over the last about three or four years. And when I first became an investor, I was focused mostly on fundamentals, not mostly, entirely on fundamentals. So I was a completely a believer in just looking at the fundamentals, the financials of a company, and that's how you can um, judge a company and that's how you buy a company. But I found examples during the last three or four years where when you look at the technical side of the business, the charts, you can actually find that you can just buy on momentum, buy on sentiment, and you can actually ride that momentum, ride that sentiment, and actually grow your value of your wealth quite substantially doing that. So I use charts, I use moving averages, um, I use all these technical signals to figure out where to buy into a chart. So mostly I look for uh, t mostly turnaround stories. So I follow companies as a share price goes down and then I look for signs of a change in sentiment and momentum. And so in example here, I've got Costa Group. The chart on the left there on the bottom left is a bit of a change in sentiment around August, uh, late August is when they released the half yearly report. Um, not only were they quite bullish in that report, we also saw the chart react to that bullishness in, in that report. So we had two things uh, that led to the change in sentiment was a change in the share price um, leading to, actually, it was actually driven by the change in the sort of sentiment of the report, which led to a change in the technical. So sometimes you see a change in the technical first and then the change in the financials in all the sentiment in the financials, or it's the other way around. Fortescue is an example where there was a change in the technicals first, and then we saw a change in the uh, financials, and it was based mostly off the Vale disaster mine. So it's something Fortescue couldn't 
really control, but that followed a change in the signal in the chart. So those are my two investing strategies, a long-term growth and the momentum sentiment strategy. Just going to go into detail here. So the momentum sentiment uh, strategy is I could be looking at holding a company from between one day to five plus years. In fact, Treasury Wine I own for three days. Uh, in fact, I did actually a one day trade, actually a one hour trade in ZipPay. Um, so I've held a company for one day, made a $100 out of that trade, so yay me. So I held Treasury Wine for three days because the story changed quite rapidly. And um, at the other extreme, I hope to maybe hold a company in this momentum sentiment strategy for five plus years, 10 years. As long as that trend goes up, I will hide and hold them. So what I use in a buy and sell, what I use in this momentum sentiment strategy is I use technical signals to buy and sell. So uh, just trend lines, um, that's the main thing I'll use here. So. If a company remains in an upwards trend, there's no point selling because if it remains in the upper trend, you're going to keep on gaining some value. And until it breaks through that upward trend, there's no point selling. So until the time it breaks through that, that uptrend on the downside, that's when you sell. But there is a little bit of a different take on this also, is if you have a technical buy signal that corresponds to a positive fundamental signal, signal uh, that becomes even more powerful. And I've seen that quite a few times. I saw it with, with uh, Fortescue, I've seen it with Costa Group, and I've seen it quite a few times where you had the duo signal of a technical buy and a fundamental buy, and that's a very powerful momentum sentiment signal. So some of the companies I own within this basket include Blue Scope, and I bought that just based off a technical signal and its share price is still going up. S32, this is, someone could argue that S32 is trading within a range. I would actually argue against that. They are, it does seem like it is changing, tra trading through a range, but I think uh, it might break through that range on the upside. So I'm not selling just because it, if it breaks down on the low side, um, on the low side of that of that trading range, so below that trading range, that's when I will sell out. But I think there's a chance it might break above that trading range, which then will be a bullish sign. And then Costa Group. So this was a buy I bought based off for both a fundamental positive signal and a technical positive signal, which corresponded exactly on the same day because of a really good half year report in August. So my long-term growth strategy. So this is companies that I want to hold for as long as possible. So I've got there plus five years. So plus 10 years, plus 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. If I held one of these companies for 40 years, I can almost guarantee you that this is gonna be a massive multi-bagger. So what I do with these companies is I'm buying on potential and sometimes I'm buying on a story, so it um, can be quite risky just buying on a story, but I believe that sometimes stories do play out. And the main thing about this strategy is to diversify and buy a large basket of companies because the success rate of this strategy is about 60%. That's what my aim is. So I want 60% of the companies I own within this basket to be successful. And if you don't think about it, you might think you're not gonna get much value out of that, not much growth. But if you get 60% of the companies that you own for multi years, the chances that some of those increases in values for those companies are gonna be substantial increases in values. So it could be looking at 100%, 1000%, 10,000% increase in value for some of those companies you hold for the long term. Compared to the 40% of companies that don't succeed because the story changes or they just can't fulfill their promise, the greatest loss you're going to make on any company that doesn't succeed is 100%. More than likely, you'll sell out before it goes, you lose 100%, so you could be losing 30%, 40%. So just do those numbers. You could be looking at the high side of a 1,000, 10,000% gain, or low side, at worst case, 100%. So when you're talking about a 60% success rate, if you ride your winners as long as possible, you're gonna see substantial gain in your portfolio. Now, the biggest thing here is knowing when to sell. 
And uh, the main thing I do when I'm thinking of selling is all about if the story changes. So I have a, a reason why I bought into a company, and if that reason or that story changes, I will sell out. A large part of that story is management. So I do have more leeway when I'm selling compared to my previous strategy, my momentum sentiment strategy. So in my momentum strategy, sentiment strategy, I have rules I follow to the T. So I stick to those rules 100%. When I'm doing this long-term growth portfolio, what I do is a little bit more leeway. And a perfect example of this is A2 Milk. So I've held them since about 2016. Around $2 I bought, they've gone as high as $20, so almost a 10 bagger. In the last few months, I've become less trustful in management. And it's based mainly off uh, what happened. They released their report in August. I think it was August. Then um, they sold a lot of the management, or the, the you know, a lot of the management sold a large, substantial part of their shareholdings. And then one month after they sold all their shares, not all their shares, some of their shares, they released a profit downgrade. It's just, um, uh, I don't want to say suspicious, but the timing could have been a little bit better. So it makes me think, uh, management is thinking that there's something not right with the business and that's why they sold out of large shareholdings in their company. So what happens, what's going to happen in the future? I haven't sold out because of that. So it's it's one cross against their name. And what I'm going to do is over the next few months, next three or four months, if there's any more negative news in relation to management, so if there's any more profit downgrades, if they start selling any more stock, that would be another cross. And after a few crosses, that's when I start to think I should sell out this company because my faith in the management has been eroded. The story has changed because management is a large part of the story and that's when I might sell out because there might be better, better opportunities out there, even though A2 Milk has been a significant uh, wealth creator for me. So what are some of the companies I hold within this, uh, this basket? So first one is Big Tin Can. So this is another company where over the last few weeks or months, actually last month or so, I've become not skeptical, but I've become a little bit more weary, leery, leery, weary, leery of the company because their last quarterly report wasn't the best report. I think even they would admit it wasn't the best report. And I think uh, to increase my faith within the company and the management, I think the next few reports have to be uh, shoot the lights out. And I think I do think they will shoot the lights out, but there is that little bit less faith in the management and the company that I had previously. Uh, so I dev, this is a company I have, uh, I think it's quite promising and there's a good chance they will grow substantially in the next five to 10 years. AVA Risk Group has been a massive winner for me over the last six months. In fact, it's been a six bagger and I think there is potential this can be a massive multi bagger for me and other shareholders as it grows its profits, grows its cash flows over the next five, 10 years. EOS Electro Optical. So this is a combined sort of a defense company with uh, space and space communications. I've done a, a video on this company and so I'm really interested in the space and space communication. I think over the next few years we're really going to see this company grow quite substantially based off uh, both sectors, both defense and the space and space communication. AG, uh, AJX Alexium. So the main reason I bought into this company was a story. So I, I try to not buy in as many stories as possible, but they have a technology called a phonon cooling technology. And because I'm a runner, so I run every day, I'm looking for this sort of thing where, for instance, I went for a run today, it's really humid, I was sweating profusely, and I was quite hot. And so this phonon technology that uh, Alexium has developed is sort of a technology where they call it perpetual cooling. So if you wear a shirt with their technology that has been applied to it, it would cool your body down. In fact, the warmer you get, your body gets, the more effective the cooling becomes. So this is highly exciting technology for someone like me. It's the personal thing. So that's why I bought into Alexium. Just because I want them to succeed, I want this technology to succeed. And last thing is mesoblast. So 
I've got here, I largely ignore technicals. So what that means is I don't really care about the short-term movement in share price. Uh, and when I talk to about short-term, I'm talking about you know daily, weekly, that sort of thing. So a few months ago, uh, the Mesoblast share price did go down based off news from the FDA, FDA they did not want to hear. Uh, it wasn't a successful um, FDA approval for one of their products. Uh, it wasn't a disapproval, it was sort of a delayed approval, I suppose you could say. They wanted more data, uh, the FDA. So the share price uh, fell quite a bit based off that, but I don't really care about that. It doesn't concern me because when I think about 5, 10, 15 years down the track, there is a chance that, uh, a good chance that Mesoblast will be significantly higher valued than it is right now. It may not be, but there is a chance it is, and I think it's in that 60% chance. So now, uh, those are my strategies. There are some inspirations behind these strategies, um, not direct inspirations, because I actually developed these strategies before I found these inspirations. But these inspirations I've found uh, provide me with uh, additional thoughts to how I invest. So let's get to the first one. So this is a guy called Tony Kynaston. So he has a podcast, uh, and they call it QAV, which is Quality and Value podcasts. So they look for cheap quality companies, this uh, Tony Kynaston. And uh, the other, th the main thing or different thing they have over other value investors is they have a momentum sentiment uh, uh, a rule. So they, ha I think they look at the week, or actually it's the monthly chart and they have a three point trend line. And when it goes, the share price goes above that trend line, they buy. If it goes below that trend line, they sell. So they use that trend line as a sentiment um, value to know when to buy and sell. So you can see here the average return on its portfolio over the last 20 years is 19.5% per annum. Um, so they do have a podcast, and I do actually recommend you have a listen to that podcast. You can also pay and join their service. Their, their, you can, see what they buy and sell and join that service. So uh, I've, this is sort of a, sort of a, uh, when I look at my momentum and uh, momentum and um, sentiment strategy, it's very closely aligned to this. It's not exactly closely aligned because I don't really look at monthly charts. I look more at daily and weekly charts, but I just like the fact that this guy is a value investor who also uses technical side and I think that's fairly rare. I don't see that very often and that's why he's a bit of an inspiration. I like to listen to this guy speak. Uh, he has given me inspiration in some of my investments uh, during the past two years I've been listening to his podcast. The other one is Nahir Van Mahanti. So he uh, runs Extreme Opportunities with Motley Fool and I actually do listen to their podcast and one of the things I've really found uh, during that time I've listened to the podcast is how closely aligned the way he thinks to the way I think in his investments and just in his general thinking of the economy and that sort of thing, uh, which is uh, quite, not disturbing, but it's, uh, it's very interesting how closely we align ourselves. And I did actually join their extreme opportunities just to have a look at the companies they buy in. And I was very surprised to see the companies I bought in are very closely aligned to the companies that Extreme Opportunities have uh, invested in. So I really like to listen to the Motley Fool uh, podcast with uh, the other guy, Scott Phillips. So uh, that's every they release a podcast every Friday and a mailbag every Sunday. So I find some inspiration within the, those uh, podcasts. I probably agree with uh, Nirvan or Doc, as they call him, about 80 to 90% of the time. Uh, and it's just eerie how close our thinking is not only when it comes to companies when it comes to uh, the economy uh, when it comes to say the Reserve Bank we both you know think very negatively about the Reserve Bank and think it's pointless and useless but anyway so those are two inspirational people or investors or experts I do listen to find inspiration uh, in listening to them speak and I do find I, I do get ideas from both of those uh, other guys 
So that's all I got on this video in my investing strategies. I hope you've taken some away. I hope you, hope you, it's made you think about your own investing strategies. I think everyone's individual investing strategy is going to be different from everyone else's because everyone has a different risk portfolio, so risk strategy. So it's going to be more risk averse people out there than I am. Maybe even more people out there are more risk taking. So I think you have to find what sort of risk you can take. So I'm very much a risk taker. I can handle a lot of risk, uh, but there's some people out there who just can't handle the risk. And I think you have to find that sort of uh, risk you can handle and then develop a strategy around that. That's what I've done. And I think it's also good to uh, really like to research companies. So in my um, long-term growth portfolio, I love to research up and coming companies and just to see them grow through time is really exciting. And I'm finding it now really exciting with my momentum sentiment uh, portfolio is just to follow these companies whose momentum or sentiment has changed, for instance, Blue Scope and Costa Group, and just see how they go with time. So I find it really exciting. And I think that's very important within uh, your investing life is to find some excitement there, find something you're really passionate about. And I think if you do find that, um, you'll find that your investing strategies will be quite successful for you. So uh, I'm not a professional. I should say that uh, right now. So I'm not a professional. So if you actually do need professional advice for your own financial circumstances, make sure you seek out someone who is qualified. So that's all I've got for this video. Hope you've enjoyed it. Hope you've taken something from it. That's all I've got. Have a good day.